doesn't matter. It's about sharing and learning. It's not always about talking down to people. It's also about sharing within ours. So I would like to call upon the chairpersons, uh, Vivek Bindal, Vijay Borgaonkar, Anjali Dawle, Pramod Shinde, please. Yeah, you can come from here. Safer for you. So everybody, uh, please clap for Pramod Shinde walking the ramp. <laughs> All right. So our first speaker is Rajesh Srivastav. Without wasting any further time, Rajesh, over to you. So I, I can say this. Suppose two o'clock in the night, your residents call you, sir. There is an emergency patient. And you went to see him, there is a CT scan with him, they have written that there, there is some gangrene in it and there is no time you have gone in in the night and this is the picture. So in hernia surgery, there are so many uh, conditions, so many situations where you don't have time to think. Say for example, in this patient, you need some guidelines, something which will tell you what to do in this type of situation. So we, ha I, we have gone in and we are doing, uh, uh, bringing the bowel down, but you can see the whole bowel is gangrenous. So in this case, what we did, we, uh, we, we had given a small incision and uh, we did a primary anatomical repair. So I am Dr. Rajesh Srivastava. I am going to speak on hernia when there is no time to think. Uh, when we talk about literature, it is said that early detection and intervention in a complicated abdominal hernia is best for reducing uh, the rate of mortality. And it has been said that higher the mortality rate, if you delay the surgery for 24 hours, you might lose the patient as well. So talking about timing of intervention, there is a beautiful paper in World in Journal of Emergency Surgery, they have uh, published it in 13 and they, they uh, uh, second meeting was on 17th and they have given some uh, guidelines. So whenever you think there is some uh, emergency, there is some strangulation, there is some obstruction, whenever you think it, the you should tackle the patient immediately. There is no time to think. And that is grade one C recommendation. And these are the factors like uh, SIRS, CCT, creatinine, phosphokinase, D-dimer, lactate, these all parameters guide you to uh, show the emergency situation of the patient. Whether to do laparoscopy or open, it depends upon your expertise, the benefit and risk of each technique, the nature of the hernia and open conversation should never be thought as a crime. You should always keep open conver conversion to a uh, lap whenever you feel you are stuck up. This is again a guidelines. Diagnostic laparoscopy is a very useful tool when you uh, want to tackle the strangulated hernia. It not, on, not only guides you how you are going to proceed, but if you are converting the lap to open, it guides you to plan the incision, to uh, 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 do the final things. And repair of incarcerated hernia, both ventral and groin may be performed by laparoscopic approach. Even if strangulation is suspected, if you can give the benefit of laparoscopy, nothing like that. And there is, that is a level 2C recommendation. So this is the patient, uh, uh, obese patient which has come to us. And see, this is uh, obstructed hernia. In obese patient, if you think of doing uh, open surgery, we know it's a, it's a big challenge because of the thickness of the abdominal wall, because of fat. So you go laparoscopically and as I said, that is the recommendation and see how difficult, with difficulty you can bring down the bowel. The second thing is you inspect it. If you find everything is fine, then and then only you can place a mesh, it will come in uh, the next guidelines. So in this case, we found that bowels are okay. And then this is the non-absorbable suture as the patient was very obese. You can see the defect was only three centimeter, but we tried to put 20 by 15 centimeter mesh in it and we did IPOM in it. Say for second example, again a high BMI patient, 52 BMI patient, acute abdomen, she has come to you 
and there is no time to think because you don't know because the symptoms in obese patient are not that uh, obvious the, than in uh, thin patient. Third one. So in this you patient, you can see the CT scan. Yeah, you can see the thickness of the uh, abdominal wall. Now you are confused whether the bowels are viable or dead. The first thing and the best thing to do laparoscopy is you enter into the abdomen and then decide what to do. If the bowels are live, then you can proceed. Now in this patient, the defect was four centimeters and we were in. So we decided to do TAPP, uh, sorry, TARM uh, in this patient, transabdominal uh, retromuscular repair and patient uh, was doing fine and went, everything went very well. So this is a linear LVI which you can see. So I'm not going to talk uh, uh, talk on techniques. So this is the uh, roof which uh, we have closed with Stata fix, and this is the uh, peritoneum and PRX complex which we are closing. And we put a large mesh. The case is over. Now the literature says if your first intention in obstructed hernia is exploratory laparotomy, you are going to increase the morbidity of the patient. One might be not expert in doing laparoscopic uh, repair or whatever, but diagnostic lapro lap laparoscopy is one of the very important clinical tool for better post-operative outcomes. Now, this is a paper of Dr. Palani Velu where uh, in incarcerated hernia, although in both the cases, uh, there is incarcerated omento cell. Now, in one patient, you can see we are doing TAPP. In other patient, we are doing ETAP repair. The trick is, if the momentum is not coming, in this patient, again, these are emergency because they usually come with pain. Then in both the patient, you can see we have detached the momentum. And once we have detached the momentum, then in ETAP approach, we have brought everything in and we have kept in endo bag. And in a TAPP approach, uh, we have fixed the mesh and we have done hybrid procedure, which where we have given an incision on the scrotum and take, uh, taken out the redundant uh, momentum from the scrotum. So this is the bag which is kept and everything uh, is put in the bag and that is taken out through the umbilicus. Now, we know the classification of wound 1, 2, 3, 4. I, I don't want to leave you alone without giving any guidelines. So what is the guidelines? This guideline says if the uh, level of wound is uh, class 1, there is obvious, uh, um, it is very obvious that you will use mesh in this because of lower recurrence rate without any uh, increase in wound infection rate. And processes is a must. Coming to class uh, CDC class wound 2. So in class 2 wound, they have also suggested that uh, if, uh, if there is no, uh, spillage is less and even if there is strangulation and you have done anosmosis you can place a mesh it is associated with lower risk of recurrence uh, again it is a very controversial issue i will i will uh, i will leave upon you but the guideline says you can very well do in class 2 wounds coming to class 3 and class 4 wounds uh, if it is class 3 class 4 for less than 3 cm you do primary repair if more than three, three centimeter, you can do biological mesh repair. Or if the patient is unstable, you can do the open management of wound. You stabilize the patient and then you can do, do second surgery. Regarding entry micro microbial prophylaxis, if the patient is class one, uh, short term prophylaxis means less than one pre-op, one post-op. If class two or class three, they have said to give prophylaxis of 48 hours only. And for class three and bad wounds, they have uh, said that antibiotic prophylaxis for a long time. Now, even when you think that you are an expert uh, in hernia surgery and you can tackle everything by your, uh, by your skill like I am doing, this is an ETAP case, this is obstructed hernia, I tried to uh, do ETAP in this repair, I thought I will, uh, I, will, I will finish the case by ETAP technique and see when I bring, it, bring the ball down. So it is almost frank pus. So this is a mistake which I have done, it should not be done, but bowel survival in this case, so uh, we put a, uh, one second, sir. So we put a vicral mesh and uh, uh, we could, we could uh, uh, complete the procedure. Fortunately, till now, this is a video of one year back and patient is not having recurrence. So thank you very much. So thank you very much, Dr. Rajesh Srivastava.
and with this we will next to the uh, next session is uh, hichika's guide to awr dr somya kullar as dr ramanna has said these are the magicians of awr so the dream girl dr somya kullar tall claims i don't think i can do justice to that um i had an agenda so the hitchhiker's guide was just taken to create some intrigue i'm not here to give you a guide as to the kind of uh, courses you are supposed to do to get into awr no probably this talk will go on a little deeper level so i am going to talk about a surgeon's journey a young surgeon's journey i consider myself young um or maybe a practicing surgeon's journey who have not as of now gone into awr and want to go into it so what is the attitude that you need to adapt to go into such a journey when we talk about awr sometimes when people like us if you are in a individual setup or if you are alone you don't have much of a team around you and you want to venture into awr it seems like a very long lonely journey it needn't be so actually you can always hitchhike and get on to the bandwagon of awr so when we talk about hitchhiking it's actually definition wise is supposed to be either a ride that you have taken which can be free or you need to probably pay some money for it trust me when it comes to awr surgery you are definitely paying some money um this whole uh, conference that we are in about abdominal wall reconstruction the deep impact that dr ramana has actually managed the whole delhi home team has actually managed if i start taking the uh, names i think i'll run out of time but this amazing uh, conference that everyone has put together you know why because in the last few years in the last decade or so there has been such phenomenal work about awr and it has become so glamorous i may say so why is this new search the concepts are not new but today when a dr henny ford walks on to the dais it's nothing less than probably amitabh bachchan walking in yesterday you should have seen the standing ovation that flavio got from the robotic course so what i mean to say is here yesterday in the faculty dinner i'm just turning around and i'm a starry eyed because like there are all stars around you and why did that happen that happened because each and every person has now gained that stature it has become glamorous so obviously we all want to be part of this but it's obviously the social media that has brought all of us close from various countries and because of all of this i think now people are publishing more complications also coming forth being more um i would say candid about things discussing out more and i think that's a very very good trend which we are going towards now obviously for people like me who want to go on to the bandwagon of awr you need help you need the hitchhiking so a lone surgeon what do you want to do when you want to go on to this journey first yourself why yourself why this was a very beautiful thing which was told by dr heni takla yesterday in the robotic course know your why so now you know your why you need to understand awr you know that it's a fascinating field you want to learn it you want to find a niche i am a general surgeon in a gi surgery unit and i had always had this huge imposter syndrome that i am a general surgeon but now i found my niche no one touches hernia there i do so find your niche that's when you'll probably get your identity and obviously when you want to find the niche you need to have a very deep understanding of the nuances of hernia surgery and tailor the repair to the patient not to you so you need to know the a b c the anatomy the biology and the comorbs of the patient each patient based on i mean it's not about what technique you can do if a cld patient with lot of varices there comes to me i may just go do an only and come out what is safe for the patient is the best and finally then that's when you start to embark on the journey once you have figured out the why now when you embark on the journey you definitely need to have your destination and in your destination first have your bearings where do i stand as of now what's my uh, you know what is the kind of repair that i'm doing now 
what are my means if i'm a lone surgeon i do not have any um, backup i do not have assistance i do not have robotics i obviously cannot want to do that i need to know my means and to learn anything of this new sort we are all practicing surgeons i think we need to learn to unlearn and you need to have a map your gps so you need to know the path you need, need to take if i am going to be doing awr i first need to go on to probably good retrorectus repairs go on to open tars go on to etips for inguinals etip ventral i think dr ramana knows i have been extremely slow in probably adopting all these techniques because i've gone very very carefully and i think that's how we should also do and be ready for detour sometimes you may not end up where you want to and know your fellow passengers by that i mean here we have a community you have your peer group i have this amazing group i will talk about you have a safe space you can talk out things you can discuss your complications and you definitely need to have some external validation how much ever you may say that you don't want it and most importantly have a guide a, a guide who can tell you the don'ts who can give you con constructive criticism who can nudge you out of the comfort zone and who can help you with handling complication i have innumerable in the guides here finally don't have ego you need to ask for directions in such a you are a surgeon you cannot afford to make mistakes mistakes will still happen but you should always try to avoid so ask for help when required and put up your complications for critical review and finally yes know how to troubleshoot my journey i'll just take you very short i have just one and a half minutes left this was a meeting in feb 2017 if i'm not mistaken dr ramana and uh, this is me in one corner this was my introduction to awr and i think i was so amazed and i was a sponge i was trying to understand and take in everything that was all around me along with that when i embarked on this journey i have major stage fright i have a big imposter syndrome so in all of these things to overcome that i think has been a big deal and definitely the awr community so joining this community has given me a platform has given me the probably um, road to success or road to learning i would say youtube all of us have learned from youtube we say we shouldn't be youtube surgeons but come on you have to admit it's a very very huge platform for learning and nowadays the phenomenal kind of videos that are coming up on youtube you cannot not say that you've learned from it i have definitely learned a lot from youtube and obviously the ihc ihc page and facebook which has all these amazing cases being discussed everyone giving their opinions so in real time you know what's going on and what people all around the world are doing um when i talk about my awr family i think the first and foremost is dr minakshi she took me under her wing and she really nurtured me and she said you can do it don't be scared and my friends we have been seeing hanging around all the time and they made me put this picture i wasn't going to and yes my mentor so i have a lot of mentors first and foremost dr ramanna ahem you are also one of them i will just acknowledge you <laughs> to humor you but dr ramana you have been a great force in trying to force force me and push me out of my comfort zone dr jignesh going to his body lab was i think a, a revelation i learned so much about it and uh, it was an amazing journey dr rahul who's my etep guru and uh, probably the first person i call when i have a complication i'm like why did this happen and he's actually gone through all my videos with great uh, patience and tried to see where i have gone wrong and guide me towards it and dr ashwin marsukar who has taught me term and i i would say that i can do a mean term right now um i have not gone for these uh, amazing courses and observerships that you have abroad uh, my friend vishaka your, has your my, my friend ashwin has i have gone to our kolkata and learnt a lot from our home talents amazing talents and these are my numbers as you can see the red part shows that it is um 
my AWR journey and it's increasing slowly. And now venturing into robotics. Somaya, so your time is up. Somia. Okay. And uh, now from magicians, we march forwards towards the astrologists. And uh, these are the people who can predict future accurately. So let's hear playing hear Nostradamus you. from Dr. Vinayak. Till he sets, Dr. Vinayak Rangan is one of the uh, very dedicated worker of AWR. He has some beautiful uh, YouTube videos. So go ahead, Dr. Vinayak. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Uh, so, we all start off with a blank slate, at least most of us. As men and women of science, we are loath to use terms such as prediction, astrology in casual use. But the last few years have been incredible. If you think a French occultist who lived 600 years ago had something to offer to hernia surgeons of today, you are wrong. We ain't here to talk about him. That was merely a clickbait for me to make you attend this course or to attend this you know, lecture. But here I am to talk about how you can use prediction, how you can use artificial intelligence, what is machine learning, what is deep learning and how you can use that to change the way surgeons operate, surgeons think. So my talk is the power of prediction, AI in hernia and AWR surgery. I am Vinayak Rengen. I am a hernia and AWR surgeon. My interest lies surgical education, artificial intelligence and surgery. And I am the founder of Curium.life, which is a startup based out of Chennai and Bangalore. I am also an adjunct faculty at the Medical Imaging and Reconstruction Lab, Indian Institute of Technology, Madras. So the outline of the talk is very simple. We are going to talk about three things. Radiomics predominantly, which is where I specialize in. Predictive AI and generative AI. Generative AI, as you know, is chat GPT tally. So the real fear, are computers going to take over? I will leave you to you know, guess. So just some basic stuff. So if you kind of think about, you know, whether I'm going to talk about all these complex stuff, you know, with nodes, with a lot of wires, you know, that's what we are going to talk about. So I've heard a lot of people ask me, why don't you explain the complex stuff you're talking, buddy? So the funda here is simple four or five basic forms of AI. When your computer understands text and understands the funda behind your thinking, when it tries to think, oh, what could be there when you are writing something? That is NLP, which is natural language processing. It has been in vogue for the past five to seven years. It is also the basis of chat GPT incidentally. Surgeons in the US have used it to analyze what the surgeon wants to say, nobody is going to say, I actually touched the bile duct with my monopolar hook. He is going to say, the callus was difficult. We tried multiple attempts at dissection. Now that tells you why there is something wrong and that is NLP. Machine learning is very simple. It is nothing but advanced statistics, except that you are dealing with 1 million variables, 2 million variables. You are dealing with actual mathematical data. Deep learning is something more complex. You're dealing with abstract thoughts. You're dealing with abstract images. You're dealing with a CT scan. You're dealing with humans here. You're dealing with faces. How do you convert that into actionable mathematical data? And that is deep learning. Computer vision is my area of expertise where I help. I use algorithms to identify structures, identify the common bile duct, identify the sewers muscle, identify a mesh in a CT scan. And that is computer vision. Generative AI needs no introduction. Last three to four months, you've been immersed into chat GPT, DALI. So many C presentations I saw here peppered with images from DALI and uh, chat GPT. So venturing a little bit into radio mix, extracting a large number of features from medical images using data characterization algorithms. Here we are talking about what is not visible to the human eye. It is exactly something like how a dog is able to hear sounds which are way beyond human frequency. A human can hear certain sounds. But then a radiologist might look at a CT scan and say, oh, everything is normal. Look, I can see it in front of my eyes. What you see, is it real? 
is there something beyond your human vision which the computer is able to pick up and identify and that is radiomics and that is what we are essentially doing in our lab so there's been a lot of radiomics done in the field of brain tumor brain trauma brain bleeds again a lot of radiomics during the covid time in lung nodule segmentation automated corat score when we are dealing with huge amounts of data from ct scans so what do you see here a lot of hernia surgeons here a lot of surgeons for whom hernia is not the prime speciality can anybody tell me what you see in that ct scan over there but what if you had a tool to help you identify the mesh what you see over there with ease here you go a tool to identify a mesh nice red looking only mesh looking all too obvious so what do you see over here couple of answers some of them see a mesh i now see a mesh looking like a pretty boomerang sitting over there yeah so many apples red green yellow rotten small big an apple is an apple red green blue small the idea is to teach algorithms that not just a red shiny thing is an apple my four and a half years son you ask him what is an apple he will say it looks red and it has a specific shape he doesn't even say that shape he just says it's red but 5 years down the line he is still going to be able to identify a red green apple a yellow apple a rotten apple and how does he do that because neural networks have formed in his brain and that is exactly what we are doing with deep learning we are forming multiple networks in our brain multiple networks in the computer and those that is exactly what is deep learning so how do we do that so we took in our initial experiments when we identified the mesh we took 100 anonymized ct scans with around uh, more than 6000 slices we took 20 ct scans where the mesh was clearly seen and then we manually annotated them we you might actually think okay it's all deep learning there is not much of human effort involved i have a team of 10 engineers three surgeons who sit for hours and hours marking out objects on computer vision software praveen is over here he leads a team so <clears throat> there is a huge amount of manual effort which goes beyond every deep learning algorithm be it chat gpt be it dali there are human minds working all the time so if you actually think artificial intelligence is going to take your jobs you might want to think again because a new set of jobs is being created because there is actually humans human minds and human interaction what is powering what you see on the screen so this was fed into our curium image assist algorithm we used a novel uh, patented convolutional neural network plus transformer model a uh, little bit of technical stuff epochs image size and all that sort of stuff but what we essentially achieved was we achieved an iou a decent iou of almost 90% iou is intersection over union which essentially tells you how much the computer is able to match the radiologist so the image tile on the left is a ct image which has been recalibrated by the machine the tile on the right is the radiologist and an expert surgeon marking the ground truth which is the actual mesh so how many of you want to see some magic over here raise your hands please so here comes nostradamus so the image tile you see on the extreme right is the model prediction and it is done remarkably you know accurate similar to what the radiologist has been able to achieve and for my team this has been one of the greatest achievements in the field of computer vision because the mesh when we spoke to more than 15 radiologists before we started off this project the mesh was the single biggest challenge a radiologist faced they were not surgeons they couldn't actually identify the mesh they could spend some time make, maybe take 20 minutes and calculate the tanaka index just to show that they could do it but the mesh was the biggest biggest challenge and we are very glad that we have done it yes a lot of work needs to be done in characterization of the mesh but here it is in front of you vinayak vinayak your time is up oh. almost so oh, i think conclude? i will just finish it off we did a bit of work on ct volumetry the volumes of the sac again match what the radiologists see so uh, nothing very new a little bit of you know image segmentation the ability to calculate the tanaka index again predictive ai uh, Uh, Professor Henniford spoke quite a bit about it, so I'm not going to add too much to it. So AI essentially is not artificial intelligence, but augmenting intelligence. Thank you so much, guys. It's been a pleasure. So here is the team. 
see you all at chennai 6 to 8 february 2025 thank you so much thank you thank you vinayak and next talk is going to be by sharad sharma on a very unusual topic where he is going to tell us that losing is a good thing and probably i'm still wondering what is it about so let's hear from him yeah so this is uh, a very disruptive stage i do not know where to face uh, ramana said you have to keep going round and round uh, let me try that i mean i don't know so losing a good thing is uh, actually pretty philosophical i do not know uh, even i did not know how to conclude it so that was my problem uh, well the story is about hernias so what you see on the screen is one of our great laparoscopic uh, hernia uh, expeditions that we had gone on to so it was pretty exciting you know uh, way back in 2005 maybe even before that uh ipom as a, a new laparoscopic mesh repair came into advent and we really started uh, you know using it right left and center and we did really huge hernias defects uh, like this with meshes even larger meshes uh, bridging defects and uh, i think we were pretty happy but then we had a problem we had a problem that ipoms were expensive the meshes were expensive the fixation devices were expensive and the concept that avoid mesh in contact with viscera was pretty serious so we could not do anything yeah? we we needed to do if we needed to do something laparoscopically it had to be like this but then we had the option of open and what did you do in open generally mostly we used to do on lay in open so on lay was even when it was there it used to be a discomforting procedure because we know the mesh is right under the skin the ipom looked good but it was expensive the onlay was an option but it was not very comforting so we needed a i mean i i rather i needed an alternate procedure so what was it i mean there were some lessons which we learned from preperitoneal inguinal repair so it was not it is not new it is more than 100 years of uh, you know uh, evidence that we could do good preperitoneal inguinal repairs and uh, there was some evidence that sublay is also good so you could do a preperitoneal ventral repair there was not big evidence on that but we could do it and it was exciting so that was something which came naturally to us that we could do preperitoneal repairs uh, even in ventral hernias maybe even large ventral hernias and ipom actually taught us that we could do bridging so when you are doing larger defects the problem was that we could not bring the edges together but then yes we could bridge them that was a that was a concept which ipom gave us so incidentally even before this you know publications that i'm talking of actually i started doing these kind of open preperitoneal bridging repairs uh this what you see here is a subxiphoid hernia it was pretty large and these photos are taken by hot shot cameras i really did not have a mobile to click these photographs i used to carry a, a hot shot so you can see there were pretty decent defects large defects and uh, none of those guys have come back to me i really do not know if they have recorded or anything uh, this was particularly a bridging defect a uh, bridging mesh which i had found this was 2008 another it was an obstructed supraumbilical hernia you will see uh, with a viable bowel again uh, what i did was this was not a bridging repair i could actually manage so wherever the defect could be closed we used to close it i mean i used to close it so that was an obvious what do you call it you know kind of a uh, instinct that if you can close the defect please do it this was in 2009 it was a pretty large sac uh, incarcerated you have see lot of momentum but the neck was small so again now infra umbilically the preperitoneal planes were pretty easy to take so that was a comfortable location you could do preperitoneal repairs infra umbilically and in this patient you could even close the defect so it was pretty comfortable it was a good feeling you could put a preperitoneal mesh you could close the defect if required and it was pretty good now this is again an incarcerated umbilical hernia again i i will not go in this but here the defect i could not close the defect so what i did was i sutured the defect edges to the mesh so again there is some kind of variation that we used to do and we were pretty happy the patients were happy the pain factor was pretty low and uh, we knew that the mesh was not under the skin well this was like the exciting case that i had done and this was a 12 cm kind of an lod uh, is an obese lady elderly lady 
and I actually created huge uh, preperitoneal space and I did not at that point of time have a large mesh. So what I did was I used four meshes of 15 by 15 and I put them together and I sutured the meshes in between. So I was pretty excited about this patient did pretty well. So what I did was I looked into the literature. Okay, so how many preperitoneal repairs have been done in ventral hernias? Frankly, I really did not find much data on this. There were hardly four publications and some uh, kind of other data. And uh, it was a beginning of uh, preperitoneal repair, which was pretty nascent. So I thought, let me publish it. So what I did was I created a nice looking case report and I submitted to the journal, Hernia Journal. So what happened? Well, they actually rejected it on first go. They said, this is not an acceptable technique. So that was pretty depressing and uh, I looked into it. So as I kept preparing for this particular talk, I saw that there was something like 2015. Again, preperitoneal has come as a robotic procedure. In 2016, Yang has actually published something called preperitoneal only mesh repair and he calls it a novel technique and he says that we are reporting the first case. So I assume, I mean, how can such a publication come when you have pretty much publications maybe 20 years back done? I'm still doing these preparatory repairs. They are pretty good. Their patients are happy. And uh, of course, the patients that I choose are definitely different. So the question is, this question was asked by Ramana, where did I get lost? So we are doing these procedures and I can tell you there are people sitting here Dr. Mendele, there is uh, Dr. Kunjani, we have spoken to them and they have been doing the preperitoneal ventral hernia repairs for over the last two decades. So I think, uh, you know, none of us are actually publishing our data. Why? Maybe I got rejected and then I got dejected. Uh, maybe my institution doesn't give me the infrastructure. I do not have a mentor. My individual practice actually is busy and I get bogged down about with all that. Or I feel trivializing my procedure, I say, this is a procedure, if I can do it, anybody can do it, why publish it? So these are certain thoughts which actually put you down and you do, you end up not publishing anything. So does an average surgeon lose focus? Well, this book was given to me just now by Dr. Raman Goel and I really think it was so much, much into my talk that I actually put this. So publishing data is important. I think we are not bothered about it. We just are happy doing our day-to-day -day work, practice. But, uh, and that is also because we are distracted. We are distracted by medical device companies, IPOM companies, companies pushing us to do certain procedures. These and there is propagation of other procedures. So there are people around you doing a lot of IPOM. So since 2005, IPOM was big. So we kept doing IPOMs and not bother about other procedures. And of course, patients demand. They look into procedures, they come and ask you, I want to do, get a laparoscopic procedure. And that is the way we lose our simple, simple, maybe cheap procedures that we could have done and given better results to our patients and we don't. But then I feel all is not lost. Life goes on beyond the books. Surgeons are scientific people. We deal with a lot of anecdotal data, but that anecdotal data comes out of some kind of conclusion and patients benefit with all this. So to conclude, I would say that did I win or did I lose? I think Ramana said I lost, but no. I think I did the right thing. I made my best effort. And maybe somebody published more, did better than me, but then I will not lose because my patients will always win. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sharad Sharma, for wonderful anecdotal experiences. Before Dr. Borgaukar announces for the next speaker, I would like Pratik and Mohit to come up and tell us about this new, this exciting technology on which we could share our questions. Mohit, can you tell us? Yeah, thank you, sir. So, uh, hello, everyone. So, I'll quickly tell you that how, how to use this Slido. So, I will request everyone to just, you know, take out their mobile phones and I, I either scan this QR code or just go to slido.com and enter the hashtag AWSR. So, Please, please start scanning this QR code and I, also you can go to slido.com. I have the slido.com on my I have mobile. I click the slido.com. So next. So, so you have to enter the hashtag AWSR, AWRS to join. A W R S. R S. 
Yes. Join as a participant. The first window yes. hashtag is already there, so you enter A W R S and join. Yes. So, uh, uh, are you all, all guys joined in? Uh, can you raise your hands, please? Who all have joined in? I have joined. Many of us have. Yes. Yes. Uh, all caps, all small. Everything will work. Okay. So I'll just. Uh, turn active a poll sample poll for you guys so you can just you know get a hang of it so i'm just uh, 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 turning on the poll right now yeah so the poll is live right now so all you guys can just uh, pick an option and send your responses that's great mohit so and it, so i think the polls that we are going to use, and we are also going to use it for questions. Absolutely. So you have 30 more seconds to tell us anything more if you want us to do. So basically, Slido is an experiential tool that we are going to use throughout the session, not just this session, but all the sessions today and tomorrow. So all you can do is right now I can see 110 participants who are logged in. Uh, Slido is going to be used for rating the presentations as well consequently subsequently so basically please log into it ask questions and all the questions that you ask will be answered at the end of the session and if we fail to answer anything your questions will be saved with us and we can answer those questions uh, to you personally after the sessions are over thank you so much thank you thank you thank you Borgavkar sir yeah. Yeah. The next talk is a plague on both your houses, Dr. Vishaka Kalikar. Dr. Nisha, I have I have an announcement to make. Pratik from Slido is here. So after this talk, if Mohit can explain to us how to use the Slido, we can start using it right away. So will you be able to do it from the center stage? Yeah. It, in one minute? Yeah. You want to do it now? After this talk. Okay. So please go ahead. Vishaka, you please go ahead. Thank you. So I'm going to speak about something uh, which has been happening with me uh, in the past, uh, say, three years. But more than me, it's about this, this lady's life in the next seven minutes or so. So we had a patient uh, who was done an IPOM in 2017. She came to us with multiple discharging sinuses in the later half of the year. Obviously, uh, it was atypical mycobacteria. She'd had all the cultures done before, but somehow nobody did a mesh explantation. She kept roaming and roaming and roaming. So when she came to us, we did a laparoscopic mesh explant for her. And then she did receive nine months of atypical mycobacterial treatment. Following which she had a huge recurrent incisional hernia. The problem is that at this point in time, the incisional hernia had also a loss of domain. But because she had atypical mycobacteria already, we had to wait for a certain period in time to get to that repair at some point in time. So we waited for a good two years before we actually took her on table. We obviously did a pre-Botox six weeks before we planned her open bilateral tar. Once we did the open bilateral tar, we hoped that everything would be fine. This is her scan on post-op day 7. Now why have we scanned her on post-op day 7? We have scanned her because she is not looking too well. She has got some low grade fever. Though there is no tachycardia, abdominal soft, she is eating well. But still she does not look good. So we are ruling out any intra-abdominal pathologies. Now it's just been one week, so obviously the wound is, looks fairly okay, there's nothing, no discharge, nothing at all. So we send her home and everything is good. She comes for suture removal two weeks down the line and till then there is no problem. Then this is what happens at six weeks following the open bilateral tar. So she now has multiple discharging sinuses on the scar as well. And we scanned her, we did the MRI, and obviously there was some collection in the transversus plane. And this time, she was not willing to undergo a mesh removal, which we actually offered her in the first sitting. So this is what we did. We opened her up, we gave her multiple sessions of VAC therapy, 
and after around four to five settings of VAC, we did a, a secondary closure for her. So this is a secondary suturing, everything is fine. And three months post the VAC therapy, everything is looking good. So I'm like, yes, now the nightmare is gone. We are all okay. But what happens is she comes back to us three months down again, yet again with a lot of sinuses on the scar. So now we have to counsel her for mesh removal. Once we do that, this is what we do. We open her up, we are able to take out the mesh in its entirety, or so we thought. There is a good intact PRS peritoneum complex, so we didn't have any rents. Uh, we closed her, we put uh, multiple subcutaneous drains, and then that is the end of story in last year, February, that is February 2022. Now, what are we looking at? Why are we facing atypical mycobacteria, especially in developing countries? And this is why we are facing so many problems regarding mesh infections. Use of formalin chambers, use of glutaraldehyde as our disinfecting material, which should be a complete no. We take out the laparoscopic instruments and someone asks, we ask somebody to put hot water on that so that it does not stick to our hands. That is where the problem is of the spores of the atypical mycobacteria, the hot water. That is where the blood and the grime gets accumulated in all your instruments, the niches of those instruments, and they don't get cleaned properly. And then they come in contact with your skin and subcutaneous tissues. And then four weeks down the line, we have some atypical mycobacteria growing. This is what we need to address as a community. We don't want to talk about what is going well. We need to talk about what is not going so well in our lives. If you're on any hernia group on WhatsApp, you will see that there are multiple cases that come after an ETEP, after a TAPP, after maybe a TAR, so many mesh infections. The other thing that we do not consider amongst all this is the morbidity that the patient faces, not just in terms of quality of life, also monetary cost. So there is this very, very nice paper that says, the average cost that goes up is almost 13,000 to 24,000 US dollars per patient. And this is what the patient has lost. My patient lost everything. I mean, she probably has no money now. If she comes back to me again, I probably have to fund her bills. So we need to look at sterilization techniques. We need to know how we should do better, where we should sterilize our instruments, and what precautions we need to take so that we don't burn all our bridges that are left for the abdominal wall. You have one mesh infection, that's just one for you, but that is the only chance for the patient that you had probably given. And now that is lost. The second surgeon that she going to, he is going to have a much, much more difficult time. Now fast forward to my life in February 2023. That is one year after we did the mesh removal. She is back with multiple discharging sinuses again. We sent a culture, the atypical mycobacteria are back and my nightmare is back. This is her scan. And at this point in time, I'm just going to leave you with two questions. As we attempt to find solutions for larger than life hernias, the only, only real questions that we need to be asking ourselves is that are we heading into a modern day epidemic of infections and incurability? And are we actually digging a deeper grave for the wall? Thank you. Thank you, Vishakha, for an excellent talk, very well delivered, and some of the sentences we are going to take home. Our uh, next speaker, Dr. Deepak Subramaniam, on sacrilege in handling the scrotal hernia. Thank you. Uh, once again, thank you, the AWR Surgeons community, Dr. Ramana, and the entire organizing team for uh, you know uh, having all of us here. I think we're all feeling excited, as you could see in the poll. So when I was given this topic, uh, sacrilege, I really wanted to know what it was. So sacrilege is a violation or injurious treatment of a sacred object, site or person. Here, obviously, we're talking about the hernial sac. 
And if you look at it, I didn't know there was a movie called Sacrilege. Of course, it did not do well and it probably released in 2020. But of course, I hope to do some impression today, March 24th. So I'm Dr. Deepak from Chennai and I'm going to be talking to you about handling scrotal hernias and large ones. Just an overview of my talk will be talking about SAC and its relations with the seroma, challenges in scrotal hernias which we all probably face, what are the possible ways of dealing with the SAC with some review of literature and some conclusions. So we all know that in SACs, when inguinoscrotal hernias especially if it's long standing, if it's congenital, especially if patients are coming to you at an age group of 20 to 30 uh, when, where it's been since childhood, the relation with the cord is sometimes very difficult to sometimes handle. Similarly, if it's a long term sac, sometimes seroma is a big problem and inadequate dissection can lead to recurrences and many other issues or over, you know, dissecting can lead to orchitis and many other problems too. So what are the few challenges that we usually face? Yes, a thick sac which is adherent to all your cord structures, a smaller working space and because obviously you're doing this by laparoscopy, you're unable to reach up to the scrotum, the scrotal skin and the sac being extremely adherent. And of course, in loss of domain, you may face issues like abdominal compartment and respiratory issues. But the most important thing here is SAC and its relationship with the seromas. And that is what has been quoted in most papers when you come to dealing with your distal SAC, especially in large hernias. So what is seroma? Why is it happening? So when you treat a hernial SAC, when you do surgery, that can lead to seroma if you do an over dissection, if there is intraoperative injury due to cautery burns, etc. Selecting and fixation technique of the mesh is also responsible for causing a lot of seromas. So direct sac, yes, sometimes large direct sacs can lead to a little bit of scrotal extraction. And how does one deal with it? Yes, we all know there are two techniques here. One is your tacking and your plication. If you see the one on the right, obviously it's a large direct sac, which is the pseudo sac is being reduced there. And as you see after this, a suture will be taken to plicate the direct sac and reduce the dead space. Whereas in the one on the right side, you would see that the sac is being tacked to the Cooper's ligament. There are two places to do this, either the rectus abdominis or the Cooper's ligament. So large indirect sac, bulk of what our problems are. One, yes, a complete reduction is an option which is ideal for smaller probably indirect sacs. Transaction alone, transaction and excision of the distal sac by a hybrid method by a small incision in the scrotum. Transition and fixing the distal sac demonstrated by a paper by, in, I'll be showing the paper by Hoge Days. And of course, the prime, the abandoning of the sac, which is described in many papers as well. So reducing the sac is ideal. Yes, if you, you can do this both in your ETEP technique as well as in a TAPP. The one on the left is the uh, ETEP where a complete sac is being completely reduced here. And you can see the reduction. This is not a complete reduction, probably a almost near total reduction on the, on the right hand side of your large indirect sac. So the reduction would be a very good option as long as not much of injuries are being created in the area so that patient does not have an orchitis or any other problems in the post-op period. A transaction, if you decide to probably do a transaction in the early phase of your uh, surgery, then it's better to transact it earlier in, a, in an area and then you can ligate it. Either you can use a suture or you can use an endo loop or any other methods to probably do it here. We're obviously using an endo loop here to ligate the large sac. This was a paper that was published by the Brazilian team, Flavio Malcher's team, and this was a significant paper which said, do not even deal with the distal sac and just go for the, just abandon the distal sac and go ahead with your surgery. So these are the things, the techniques that were shown in that. So primarily a pyretide patch is created and then a peritoneal flap, which is a cuboidal flap is created and extended towards your medial as well as your lateral sides and then a mesh is created. They do not even touch the distal sac or the, or the area where the pyrite patch has been created. So that means it's a primary abandoning of the sac and they quote very good results for post-op seroma and other things. Why not open? We all talk only about MIS, MIS, MIS. Now, a large inguinoscrotal hernia in an open surgery would probably deal with the sac in a very straightforward way. All of us probably would have done this earlier in our career, even many are probably doing it even now. And probably here in these patients, we don't experience much of seroma compared to a laparoscopic surgery. One must always be aware of the giant inguinoscrotal hernia classification before venturing into all this. And coming into a little bit of literature review, uh, comparing reduction and transaction of sacs. One, most of the patients with transaction have had a higher incidence of seroma. In this particular paper in 2022, shows seroma rates as high as 70%. Similarly, one more presentation, one more uh, paper which says 
transaction which is SAC reduction says SAC transaction increased the seroma formation. This was a very interesting paper published in 2020 where it said both the transaction as well as the complete reduction of SAC actually had the same levels of seroma and no increase in the transaction side. This was another paper just published last month, 2023 February, where it said TAPP per se, more than TEP, has a much higher risk of seromas. This was the paper I was talking about, about the management, the distal sac. I think most of uh, we, all of us who are in the WhatsApp groups would have seen the video which was uh, published as well, managing the distal sac of, uh, to avoid a seroma formation. So basically, Hoge Dais in his paper explains, he imaginates the scrotal skin and pulls the distal sac and fixes it either with a tacker or with a suture. In his study, he's had 94 patients of which six were inguinoscrotal hernias and he had one patient with a seroma which he aspirated and there was no recurrence of seroma in the ultrasound even after three months or six months. So conclusions, open approach is not a bad option. Hybrid can be attempted if you are in the probably in the learning curve and transaction with distal sac fixation is a great technique if you can probably do it and complete reduction definitely not advisable because of chronic pain issues and orchitis issues. Of course, you know, my topic is sacrilege. We have to respect the sac and give respect and always take respect. Again, I'd like to invite you all in 2025 for a deeper impact in Chennai. Thank you very much. Thank you, Deepak, especially for saving us a minute. And now I'd like to invite our professor of MESH, who's going to talk to us. Jignesh is going to talk to us about MESH in a mess. Uh, thank you, Chairpersons. Uh, can I have my talk, please? I think it's been a great meeting so far and we've got uh, nice deliberations happening. I hope so that I can connect with the audience today and uh, give them some hopeful tip of advice. So I'm Professor Jignesh Gandhi from uh, Mumbai and that you can see the beautiful bridge which we have in Mumbai there. I have no conflicts of interest, but you may have to bear in some of the slides with my photographic skills. So when is a mesh in a mess? It happens when you have infection, when you have a bleeding scenario, and third is when you have a repair for a recurrent hernia. So that is the time you have, will have a mesh in a mess. Let me start off with this case number one. This was a gentleman which was operated for an open reef stopas repair. And four months down the line, he comes up there with this kind of redness in the right upper abdomen. And what we plan to do is, we plan to try to see whether we can salvage the mesh. But ultimately, with the course of antibiotics, things didn't improve. And you can see here, what we had to do was, we had to explant the mesh. But in this patient, there was a good integration of the mesh. And there was only a part of it which was floating, which we had to explant and take it out. So we explanted that mesh. And this is what was the picture of the patient when we explanted and we applied a whack to this particular dressing. This is a patient at around in between and at six months after mesh explantation. And this is a patient after about one year. So what this patient taught us was that macroporous polypropylene mesh can be salvageable. Whatever is integrated needs to stay back. Whatever is floating needs to come out. Case number two. This was a gentleman which I had operated uh, for a laparoscopic e tapping one ulnar hernia repair. And on day 5, so this was on around 30th of December, he went home on 31st, had a few drinks, he danced with his family. And then you can see that there's the big clot there. Now, surprisingly, when he came on day 5, he was hypotensive with a lot of problems. But watch this video. This is a video of the patient at the time of the index surgery when I did the procedure. And you can see it for yourself that there is a good hemostasis and everything is fine. And after five days, you can see the scenario. So I was a little bit flabbergasted that exactly what has gone wrong with this patient. Why is he landed up with this particular problem of such a massive bleeding? And when we investigated this patient, the culprit was the diclofenac. So we all use diclofenac right, left and center. But it can cause significant thromboasthenia where the platelets become a little lazy. And this patient responded very well to platelets. I had explanted the mesh in this particular patient because I didn't want to leave it in the clot sets, but I re-implanted. Now that's a debate for all of us to discuss, but I didn't want to put in the mesh, which was already kind of soaked in blood. So I explanted and re-implanted. He follows up with me till this 31st December. He came in to give me a surprise gift and he's doing absolutely fine. The third case scenario, 
This is the story of a gentleman which is a decade long, a laparoscopic TAPP done 10 years back. And after that, he's had four open explorations and eight surgeons seen him pan India. So what was the problem in this particular patient was that he came to me saying that when I have my food, I have food particles, which is stool consistency coming out from that hole. And this was a story of one decade which this patient had. And as you can see very clearly, this patient had a problem that there was a connection directly with the sigmoid colon. So we decided to have a laparoscopic approach that let's go and see at least how we can salvage and remove this particular mesh. What you can see the pointer at is my spinal needle. So my plan was that I should be radical and try to remove everything because this may be the last possible exploration for this particular patient. So we did go with the laparoscopic approach. We stapled out the fistula from inside. We had an on-table scopy to see that we are not compromising with the lumen of the colon. And then you can see here that I am marking out on table with the fluoroscopy and I found this tax. So I said this also has to come out. It has to be like a radical excision. So use of fluoroscopy. So first laparoscopy, then fluoroscopy. The next you do is you raise the peritoneal flaps and now you go and hunt for that what is remaining behind because in spite of four explorations, there is something which is sticking in there which is not being corrected. My vascular surgeons were at standby so that I do not land up with any particular problem. And then what we do is we keep on hunting for it. Ultimately, I had to use a combination of so dissection with the scissors, with harmonic. And what you can see, see is that there were two pieces of mesh which was later analyzed which were a polyester mesh. And these were completely removed with a lot of difficulty, sharp dissection, blunt dissection. But sometimes you have to be bold because you want to do and radically uh, take out everything. So these were the pieces of the mesh and tackers. We scanned the patient again with the fluoroscopy and confirmed that we have removed everything and not left anything inside the, in the patient. And that's the patient after the treatment, six months, he keeps following up and uh, he's doing pretty well. So finally, my suggestions to all of you here, Imaging is the key in a patient when your patient comes with a mesh infection. Please do a radical job at index explant surgery. Don't do a standalone job. Take a team with you because you need to remove everything. That is my first suggestion. Remove mesh, tacker, suture, everything what is essential in that particular case. Maybe by open, laparoscopy, robotic or a hybrid approach. Use all the tools possible but try to do a radical job. And in Indian scenario, please don't forget that we can deal with a typical mycobacteria in a lot of scenario. Keep an ID specialist in your team. And remember, the duration of treatment should be very long. I've seen surgeons talking to me about clarithromycin for three weeks, four weeks, one month. You have to give treatment in an atypical almost for about a year or even sometimes more. So get an ID specialist. Don't self-treat the patient. And remember that you have to do a radical job. So my final proposition, which is under peer review in the second stage, nowhere so far anyone has mentioned about coming out with a classification of explant of the mesh. We just write down mesh explanted. So we propose this nomenclature, which is now in a peer review process, that the mesh explant can be E0 uh, when you remove completely, E1 when it's a partial, E2. And I have compared the mesh explantation to the TNM classification to make things very, very simple. So I think in future, we may have a scenario where we may write a T3, N1, M1, and all of us will be in the same page. So I would request each one of you that probably we can all come together, propose this kind of a classification, adapt it in the practice so that we are all on the same page. Thank you very much uh, for bearing with me and I hope you enjoy the rest of the DI and do not get into a mess like I get in all sorts of my life. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Jignesh, for a radical talk. And don't go anywhere. We have a lot of questions for you. Sure. <laughs> thank you very much. So the next talk is negative pressure wound therapy by a robotic man of AWR, Dr. Ashwin Bawa. So good afternoon, everyone. I'll, I'll be speaking on my AWRSC journey. So I'll be speaking about my AWRSC journey, which includes uh, negative pressure wound therapy. Uh, this is a macro photograph taken of uh, granulation, healthy granulation tissue. And we as surgeons love granulation, healthy granulation tissue. 
Uh, NPWT has revolutionized current wound management practices and can be used in acute and chronic wounds. I'll be very quick with introductory slides. Uh, it's been in use since 1990s, but the photography part has uh, revolutionized uh, what we can do with NPWT. I'll be very short with uh, how we use it. If it's if it's, if it's an ulcer, we can uh, use foam and uh, put a polyurethane dressing and then co connect the negative pressure pump. So uh, the pressure can be minus 75 to minus 125 millimeters of mercury. Uh, this is also called as commonly called as VAC therapy, and this is how uh, the canister and the machine looks like. Uh, then, then how does the magic happen? So the mechanism of action can be it maintains a moist wound environment, reduces edema, draws wound edges together, removes exudates and infectious material, promotes perfusion and promotes granulation tissue. Uh, a healing wound uh, makes a surgeon happy and I'll be sharing my results. So this was a lady I'd operated uh, during COVID. Uh, she had a sigmoid perforation. I took out an ileostomy. Uh, uh, what happened later was that sigmoid uh, leaked and there was an enterocutaneous fistula. You could see it in the lower part of the wound. Uh, uh, this, this was a very young patient uh, with a constantly having her COVID positive report. So we had to put her on dom domiciliary treatment. I used a fistula uh, ring to cover the part of the fistula and applied WAC. So we were able to close her, then later identify the fistula, close the fistula and have her ileostomy close later. So this was a patient with a large only mesh infection. Uh, we were able to salvage uh, the mesh, uh, used uh, WAC again and uh, finally the patient had such a wound. Uh, so uh, these modern cameras, we've been able to document uh, what we can do with uh, VAC. So uh, this is an iPad with advanced 3D sensors, which would give you length, breadth and depth of wound and we are able to uh, note down the size. This is a patient again uh, with an ileostomy in situ enteric perforation operated, landed up with a burst abdomen. Uh, this was his initial presentation on 11th of October 2022. So one VAC application. Uh, his wound was uh, on the 18th of October was uh, this close and with subsequent uh, VAC applications without doing any se secondary suturing we were able to close his wound. This was a lady, uh, a VIP patient, la landed with bad necrotizing fasciitis. I did uh, full on, full blown debridement, removed as much as tissue as possible in one go. Uh, just as Dr. Jignesh said that you have to have, give it the full Monty in the first go. So subsequent Vera flow application was done. Uh, we were instilling, instilling uh, normal saline for, such, such, for this patient. Uh, no secondary closures were done. VAC was used and then uh, with constant dressings, we were able to achieve this result. Again, this patient had a terrible mucor. We heard about the black fungus. Uh, again, uh, debridement was done. You could see those uh, uh, black, black mucor. Uh, this was uh, tested on uh, in our microbiology lab as well. Again, uh, VAC was applied for this patient and we were able to close up. Uh, this is a carbuncle. We, as, as a predominantly diabetic population, have such large patients coming up with uh, large carbuncles back. Again, debridement was done, VAC was applied, and this was the final result. Carbuncles in the neck are also common. And again, VAC did super for us. Uh, diabetic foot is another indication where you could use VAC. Uh, this is a patient with a terrible, uh, uh, you know, we could uh, classify this using this camera and you could see how much is the yellow. Yellow is about 75% in the first go. With one VAC application, we had about 74% uh, healthy granulation tissue. With persistent VAC applications, uh, good granulation tissue was achieved. Then we uh, prepared the wound bed and applied graft and we were able to get such results. Again, diabetic foot, uh, foot wound, uh, final closure was uh, attained with VAC and debridements. This was a bad osteomyelitis. Uh, of the uh, great toe, uh, the patient was almost ready for amputation. Uh, again, good solid debridement with uh, strategic use of VAC helped us in getting this his, his great toe together. Again, 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 a very bad diabetic foot wound, uh, good debridement with use of VAC therapy and skin grafting, we were able to get his uh, foot fixed. Again, uh, uh, we can use it for the bottom, uh, pylonidal sinuses, which are called complicated we can uh, do debridement, apply VAC, and get final skin closures like this. Again, a gluteal wound where VAC was applied, and we've been doing documentation and uh, noting the wound sizes persistently. This was a large perineal tear. Uh, patient had a roadside accident, had a colostomy in situ, and uh, this wound was a challenge for us. Again, 
we used Veraflow, uh, used antibiotic installation because this wound was quite pretty dirty, then grafted it and we have a final result like this. Uh, so these days AI can be used for documenting wound infections. Uh, the fluorescence uh, uh, released by the bacterial cell bowel can be captured by certain cameras if you throw UV light and it can give us results in gram positive and gram negative. Gram negative is shown as green and gram positive is uh, shown as red. So uh, this is one of our patients with a gluteal wound. Uh, the AI captured this green area as infected. We have confirmed it on multiple uh, cell cult tissue cultures. Uh, once the VAC was, uh, was uh, used, the infection has gone off. Another one of our results, this is an uh, IND done for an abscess, uh, where you could see the red and the green. The red means gram positive area and the green means uh, gram negative area. VAC was applied and the infection has gone off again. So I can go on and on with results, again the gluteal wound, uh, with a lot of E. coli, with one VAC application, the uh, infection is gone. So uh, VAC also helps in reduction of uh, wound infection. Thank you so much. It's been a game changer for me. Thank you, Dr. Baba. It was a wonderful uh, talk on the application of the VAC. Our next speaker is Dr. Danny Rosen. He will speak on the quick hernia repair, when, why, and how. Thank you for the invitation. I lo always love to come back to India. When I was a young resident, my chief resident told me, if you can't make the surgery good and fast, at least make it fast. So he was joking, of course, that our time is not a value by itself, but it's an asset. And why does our time matter? Because it does. If you have shorter surgery, you have less complications, pulmonary complications, DVT, infection rate is going down. Of course, you reduce OR costs, which are related to the time you, are, you spend in the operating room on the patient. And of course, you can also, if you quick and efficient, increase the nurses and the all staff appreciation. So it does matter. And it's not always an easy choice whether to choose the shorter operation. This is a recent uh, um, paper from surgical endoscopy comparing 61 ETAPs to 67 IPOM plus. And of course there are some advantages to the ETAP, a little shorter hospital stay, somewhat less pain, but eventually there are similar complications and similar recurrence rate. But the ETEP was two and a half times longer than the IPOM plus operation. So there's something to think about. So how do we minimize the OR time? First, we can do select our procedure to be shorter. So procedure selection according to the patient need is important. We have to gain experience and increase our expertise in doing this operation and use various techniques to make it shorter. So for, for example, procedure selection, if you have small hernia, we used to say that the punishment should fit the crime. So do you really need a long and complicated procedure just to fix a small hernia? How do you choose the method that you prefer? So you can do it robotically and in many places this becomes the default. You can do a tap, which is nice if the patient wants a laparoscopic repair. You can do it ETEP or TARM, but you can also do a quick open surgery. And within less than 10 minutes, you can solve the problem. With a very nice hidden incision or little scar, the patient will be happy. What can you do about your expertise? How can, how can you increase that? So first we have to practice a lot and as time goes by and we do more and more, we know more and more. You can use training boxes. We should learn and should appreciate and understand the anatomy. Anatomy is the basis of our surgery. 
respect the tissue planes, and be efficient. Efficient dissection is not easy to gain. You should get your own movies, look at them. When you look at your own movie, you sometimes realize how many inefficient movements you have done. And of course, use some techniques. There are many shortcuts and time savers. I always like to go to conference because I always come back with at least one tip or trick that I follow using my, my practice. And try to be inventive. What we, you call in India, Jugad, we have many names for that. But basically, be inventive and try to find solutions for the problems in, in front of you. So I'll give you a few examples. For example, entry when you start doing a TEP procedure. So we, you can spend four or five minutes or just the hand entry, but you can do it very quickly. Now very many of you are familiar with the optical entry, and this made the entry with some movement of the scope and creating the initial space very quick. This is a real-time movie and within less than a minute, you are there. You don't have to spend 10 minutes on that. Mesh handling, also many, many surgeons lose a lot of time on spreading and uh, fixing the mesh and putting it in the right, right position. You can use some little tricks like folding the mesh. I use a easy to, to remove knot and then it just stays in place. So things that can take 10 minutes can take 30 seconds. You can always choose the mesh that you want to use. And this can affect the, the time that you spend on placing that. For example, on the left side, there's a mesh, there's recurrence after previous laparoscopic repair. This was only medial recurrence. The lateral side was completely intact. So I didn't want to dissect the whole, the whole anatomy again. I just went medially. There was a small hole. I used a ventrilex from the inside and push it, pulled it out. The same can be done for very small holes when you don't have a lot of abdominal wall to repair. You just have to close the hole. You can use the ventrilex, pull it up, just goes into place, add a little stitch to close the hole, and within a few minutes, you're done. Peritoneal tears also, you can spend a lot of time on suturing that. I use a lot of glue in my practice in hernial case, cases, and again, we can have small holes and use the glue applicator and just glue it together. Closing the peritoneal flap in TAPP also. You can suture that, sometimes it takes a lot of time. If you use the glue, it can be very quick and efficient. You have to learn the manipulation and with the glue applicator. You can see a few steps. And it's done. So being quick doesn't mean you have to rush. You have to be efficient. This is what saves time, and I think it saved one minute. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Dandy. You've been as short as the title of your talk. And now we would invite Prem Kumar Balchandran for telling us about peritoneal sac salvage in MIS ventral approaches. Request the audience for the questions for the next eight minutes after this talk. Uh, respected chairpersons, Professor Ramana and my dear friends, uh, thank you so much for this opportunity to present an inter interesting concept in uh, hernia repair. At the outset, I'd like to tell you I'm not a tar hater. I'd love to do a good tar, but procedures should be done for the right indications. And there are times when some people overdo tars. So how do we get 
out of this tech how, how do we prevent uh, doing unnecessary tars yes so what are the challenges that one faces while doing these prolonged awr procedures maintaining the retromuscular insufflation is one dealing with thinned out peritoneum and creating button holes long procedure time and it's not a single quadrant surgery you will be operating all over the abdominal wall and sometimes you will need to separate components anterior or posterior is your choice so why prevent a tar so obviously technically it's a very demanding procedure you could land up injuring the the sebilonar line you could create peritoneal drains which are very difficult to approximate uh, it's a more technically demanding procedure takes longer time and you breach a complex muscle anatomy which you may need for later on if there is a recurrence and obviously risk of diaphragmatic injury is also there so how do you go about preserving the hernia sac well there are a lot of papers on peritoneal flap preservation so whether this peritoneal flap and hernia sac is the same it's, i think it's just a small border line which you are crossing and uh, you know it's a very good procedure which we can do to avoid doing a tar so if you notice the green line that is the uh, peritoneal sac and we do, we need to take that down with the posterior layer and place the uh, mesh above that so as you can see here the blue the structure within the blue is actually the hernial sac and inferiorly you can see the green line which is the posterior layer so you need to take that down and make it continuous with the yellow layer so that you have a uh, complete kind of a continuous membrane like structure so here you can see within the star is actually the hernial sac which we preserved and you can see it being sutured to the posterior layer which if we haven't preserved definitely would have ended up into a transverse abdominis release so this is just a short video so you can see this is a m4 w2 defect it's quite a large defect and so we are preserving the hernial sac as you can see we are slowly taking away from uh, the hernial defect we are preserving the sac and taking it down so the, we can give contralateral pressure directly over the defect to bring this down and as far as possible try to avoid creating button holes in this layer and uh, at this juncture i would like you to note that the same thing if you do it in the midline you would end up taking down the linea alba so in the midline it is not advisable to try to take this down to expose the subcutaneous fat because you would actually be doing a blunder by taking down the linea alba thereby creating a further weakness in the abdominal wall so now you can see we've got a huge preserved hernia sac and you can see how much there is a deficiency in the posterior layer and if this sac was not preserved definitely we would have ended up doing a transverse abdominis release so now we will be approximating this preserved hernia sac to the surrounding uh, peritoneum and transverse alveolus fascia which we have taken down so we use a 20 uh, 45 cm or 30 cm uh, long term absorbable barb suture uh, depending on the length of the defect usually 45 cm is good enough and like i said again try to avoid creating any button holes so you can see the complete closure has been done and there is actually quite a large defect and we hadn't preserved this hernial sac this patient would have ended up doing a tar so uh, there is a lot of uh, papers on peritoneal flap hernioplasty and uh, hernial sac preservation and this is our paper which has been published in the journal of abdominal wall surgery recently and uh, this is a good technique and uh, i think whether you are going to do a tar or not it's always better to preserve the sac initially itself and if you want later you can do away with it and don't be too judicious in excising the hernial sac or realize the value of a good uh, membrane which is already there in the human anatomy and don't try to you know excise it uh, indeterminately thereby resulting in an unnecessary tar in the future so uh, i'd like to thank dr ramana once again for giving us the opportunity to conduct this conference in chennai in 2025 and uh, i don't know whether we can have such great numbers but it would be great if all of you can come and make 2025 in chennai a grand success thank you all so much Thank you Prem Kumar So it has been a great session and some great talks so now it's time to have questions from the audience floor we already have a few on the slido so any questions can you come to the mic and ask any question we have about 4 minutes for questions till uh, somebody ask one question for uh, dr jignesh 
uh, in the first case you presented that whatever mesh has incorporated let us go ahead with it and in the second immediate case i would like to ask when the mesh was very well fitted inside what has made you to think that the bleeding was because of secondary to diclofenac that is one and second is whether a simple wash in that case would not have been a salvageable so uh, thank you for the question uh, in the first scenario it was four months later when you have four months later mesh you know that there are a lot of changes which are going to occur there there was even a fear that whether we are dealing with an atypical scenario the second scenario my worry was that my blood was an ideal cultured source and we all know that any remnant hematogenic blood is going to be so i didn't want to have a mesh which was having the pores completely filled up with the blood and blood clots and that's the reason it was explanted it was on day 5 so day 5 we would not expect a mesh tissue integration because we are still in the stage of inflammation but still uh, what has made you to think that the bleeding is secondary to diclofenac uh, whether it has been you have seen it previously because right and left uh, we are so yeah, so, so uh, this was my first experience and that's the reason i have wanted to share on this platform that all of us we use diclofenac right left and center but it does cause significant thromboasthenia and we have to be very careful because this was a patient where we had done everything possible and you can see i have put up the video even before to show you the hemostasis and even after thank, thank you, you jignesh i think dr yes, parveen bhatia sir. Sir. sir in the same continuation I, honestly i also did, do not think that diclofenac can cause this and it is it is not a long term usage of the diclofenac that patient had one second do you want to impress on us that uh, with with the tissue diagnosis only that you should start anti microbial treatment or you will start for a typical mycobacteria even without the tissue diagnosis absolutely a brilliant question so to answer that first the yield of a typical mycobacteria on the culture is very very low so what happens is in about 80% of the times you are likely to miss an atypical infection because they are slow growing organisms second is most of the times i have seen surgeons taking a superficial swab which always will be a contaminant with an e coli or a klebsiella it is when you send the tissue or the mesh then is then you will find the growth of atypical mycobacteria so given a scenario if my histopathology of the material which is scooped if they tell me that they are finding a scenario of a granulomas foreign body giant cells i know that we are dealing with a granulomatous inflammation i will not wait to start an atypical treatment unless the duration of treatment like we've had patients where the patient has come back in a one month time we have swabbed it and we have grown staph aureus we have removed the mesh put them on treatment for staph aureus and patient has done fine so i think it is a histopathological diagnosis and most important is when you scoop a cavity of an atypical in any scenario don't forget to scoop the roof because quite often it happens is that surgeons we are used to scooping on the floor it is the Ignesh. roof granulation which stays back I think so let's have another sir. question because uh, yeah. we, let's keep it short yeah, because we don't want this to be a lecture actually sure. yeah sure please. another small question is yeah. that uh, before going in or taking such kind of patient it is a good idea to do the x-ray abdomen and see the number of tags and remove them all absolutely absolutely well done I think I would have like to have any you have any question i have one oh, for no, vishakha uh, uh, dr jignesh gandhi one question yes sir uh, whether any time you start uh, empirically the treatment for the atypical mycobacteria so not empirical treatment unless i have something on the tissue diagnosis uh, not definitely but i think it is the clinical presentation of the patient which tells us that what you are going to go in because any which ways if i have to select an antibiotic i will select a lisolid or i'll select a amikacin i'll select a, a clarithromycin vishakha i would like to ask in the same vein that if you say that the water could be a culprit for mott then what are we supposed to wash our instruments with this is on the slido i i have no answer to that because we all do that one so, shot answer so Jignesh, one shot on answer is please use words. ro water reverse okay. osmosis water and that is the trick because your water in a nursing home hospital comes from the same tank of the hospital and that is a culprit devashish 30 seconds yeah 30 uh, seconds wonderful talk by vishakha there is only one more thing i would like to add to prevent infections especially in cases of meshes i used even use of spirit should be banned we should use chlorhexidine because Fair it enough. damages the stratum corneum which causes release of staph epidermidis that Fair is enough. one thing and eto can be affordable in all hospitals now friends we don't want this to be a session on mott so let us stop here we just got a last question i think is waiting yeah, here yeah, last please, yes, please in yeah. case of open hernia repairs 
if there is a wound infection, mesh infection, can the uh, mesh be salvaged by using local antibiotics? So, so again, or we have uh, to remove the mesh every time. No, no. I think from it's from case to case scenario. If it's a macroporous polypropylene mesh which you are using, the duration of the infection and how long and when the patient has come to you. By and large, this mesh will be floating. It has to come out. We have a lady, obese lady, who has been uh, uh, treated for an umbilical hernia. Uh, she came to us 20 days. Uh, after let's let's not discuss cases. If it is an only mesh, then possibly salvage could be done. That it is. also depends on the plane of the mesh. So I would not want anybody sharing their cases. Let's okay. only talk about the questions. Can we use local you, sir. antibiotics, sir? Our, our Jignesh, local, 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 one, local, one word. Local one word. antibiotic placebo. It will not work. Thank you. So wonderful session. All the AWR magicians. Last. We will have to close the session. It's 3.31. Okay. So I think, friends, we have too many questions. But we would like to move on to the next question. So I thank my fellow chairpersons and uh, declare this session as to closed. Let's move on to the next one. Thank you.